In April of 1995, a terrifying virus visited grief upon the town of Kikwit in Zaire, Africa. Victims died within days. Entire families were wiped out. The killer was a deadly strain of Ebola, a virus so destructive, even the corpses are infectious. Anyone who gets near them must be doused in purging chemicals. As the people of Kikwit brought out their dead, a watching world recoiled in horror. The town was quarantined to prevent Ebola from spreading to Zaire's capital, Kinshasa. From there, the deadly virus could have hitched a plane ride to anywhere in the world. The outbreak began with patients arriving at this primitive town hospital, complaining of headaches, fever, nausea, symptoms of any number of common tropical ailments. Soon, they were disgorging black vomit and diarrhea dark with blood. Something was eating their insides. The bewildered doctors didn't suspect what was in store. Protective uniforms arrived within a few days, but it was too late. Several doctors and nurses had contracted the deadly disease. Disaster had struck. The skin of Ebola patients becomes discolored as the virus consumes the tissue beneath. The flesh begins to tear spontaneously, and blood, hot with viral debris, hemorrhages forth unstoppably. Doctors call this bleeding out. Ebola attacks every organ in the human body, the brain, liver, kidneys. The muscles in the face freeze into a mask. There is no cure for Ebola. Eight of every 10 victims die. As death approaches, the eyes roll up in the head from shock. The liquefying cadaver sheds rivers of hotly contagious virus particles. One Ebola particle can infect and kill its victim in less than 10 days. Medical workers protect themselves with layers of slick plastic, goggles, and boots to keep it out, and that still may not be enough. One nurse caught Ebola even through her protective suit. Viruses are one of man's most powerful predators. They come in different shapes and from different sources, but they're all alike. They're all parasites, bits of genetic material neither alive nor dead that wait to latch onto a living cell. The thread like Ebola, like all viruses, hijacks the cell's machinery and uses it to make more copies of itself. Copies of the virus break free to replicate again and again in other cells. That's the horror of Ebola. As the virus multiplies, the body fails. Ebola struck 296 people. Only 63 survived. <laughs> Nurse Melanie Mbouyi is one of the lucky few. I was frightened, watching my colleagues dying like that, like pigs. I was truly terrified, but as I too got sick, the suffering became so great I lost my fear. I stopped caring about anything, even about dying. In fact, I wanted to die, just to die, rather than go on suffering like that. As the highly contagious virus spread, some hospital workers fled in terror. Nurse Rafael Mikolo stayed. He contracted the disease just by closing the eyes of his colleagues. When you're vomiting blood, bleeding from your eyes and every other orifice, no one wants to come near you. So we lay there, abandoned and despairing. Then, mercifully, medical help arrived with the right protective gear. Says Mikolo, it was like a miracle from God. Only a few organizations in the world are equipped to handle a deadly virus like Ebola. Experts call the infected area a hot zone. The virus troops are in constant training to respond to rare threats like Ebola. They've developed an isolation stretcher to keep a killer virus from spreading from the victim inside to others. 
The officers of the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases are hot zone experts. USAMRID task forces drop into infected areas equipped with antiviral spacesuits, each with its own filtered air supply. The USAMRID team was more than ready for Kikwit's call for help. They had seen Ebola before in two outbreaks in Africa in 1976. But more alarmingly, it had been right in their own backyard much more recently. Reston, Virginia is 15 miles from Washington, D.C. and 30 miles from USAMRID's home in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Ebola came here in disguise, jumping from one of the poorest areas of the globe to one of the richest. It landed right next to this playground. Reston used to be home to a quarantine center for imported monkeys, like these macaques. The monkeys would spend a month in Reston, awaiting shipment to buyers all over the country. In the fall of 1989, dozens of the Reston monkeys suddenly began to hemorrhage and die. Usamrid received blood and tissue samples from the dead animals for testing. What the experts saw terrified them. In the microscope, they saw the telltale strands of the killer Ebola virus. All of the known agents of that family were very lethal for men. And here it was in the United States. General Philip Russell was commander of U.S. Army Medical Research at the time. So we had an organism, new virus, uh, that presumably uh, was, was like its cousins and uh, in the United States and killing monkeys. And uh, so the public health uh, um, um, danger was, was very obvious. But it was even worse than they feared. Monkeys throughout the facility began to die. That meant that this strain of the Ebola virus was airborne, unlike its cousin in Africa. If human workers breathed deadly virus particles, they might contract it. And from there, Ebola could spread throughout the entire Washington area. The army went into action. They quietly destroyed 500 monkeys and drenched the building with chemicals to kill any remaining virus inside. Eventually, the entire structure was leveled. The monkey handlers never got sick. Researchers studying the virus discovered that this strain of Ebola doesn't affect people, only monkeys. No one knows why this strain is so different from the killer strain. I think you can make a good case for that we ducked a, a bullet, that we were very, very lucky. Yeah. But a killer still lurks in the jungles of Zaire. Finding it is the challenge. The no matter where in the world viruses strike, medical troops go into battle. When the mystery virus Ebola reared its head in a remote tropical jungle, the virus hunters raced to track down the killer. Men like Tom Kaizak, formerly U.S. Army, he's now head of virus assessment at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, the only other place in America that can handle hot viruses. He travels with a lightweight version of the spacesuit to work in the primitive lab at Kikwit General. As field team leader, Kaizak's job is to help contain the latest outbreak, gather infected blood for closer study back home, and track down Ebola to wherever it hides in nature. Ebola is a virus that exists someplace here in Zaire. It's popped up twice within the last 20 years. The episode seems to start as a single case that then gets transmitted amongst the family. The Kikwit outbreak is a rare opportunity to trace the mysterious origins of the disease. Virologists Don Noah from Kaizak's CDC team and Cherry Mertens from the World Health Organization in Geneva plot the epidemic's course. 30, 31, 32, 33 people. 33 people infected by the same person. The virus detectives must identify the first person infected, the index case, as it is known. The researchers want to know where in nature Ebola hides between its rare explosions. The trail leads to the home of a poor charcoal burner called Gaspar Menga, 
who came to the hospital bleeding out back in January. His father, Papa Menga, and the surviving family helped to reconstruct Ebola's devastating passage through their lives. The family brings out photographs of Gaspar, standing on the right in this snapshot. When Gaspar died, his family crowded around the coffin for a farewell picture. Some reached out to touch him one last time. After death from Ebola, the dissolving cadaver leaks fluids that are saturated with particles of virus. The mourners soon fell ill themselves, and they too began to die. Gaspar's wife, his child, his uncle. Eleven family members followed Gaspar to the grave. Two fled Kikwit to an outlying village, carrying the hungry virus with them. The memory of this nightmare haunts the Mengas. Adding to the horror, their terrified neighbors threatened to burn down their homes. The question now is, why Gaspar Menga? Where had he been? What reached out to him from the forest? Like many other charcoal burners, he would leave home early each morning to trek into the forest. He dug out his charcoal pit in a clearing, back-breaking work to produce an earthen oven that devours the forest in its smoldering belly. Somewhere out here, the Ebola virus touched him. Like all viruses, it has a natural habitat. Researchers believe it lives in an animal without causing disease. It is only when a virus leaves its host animal that it becomes dangerous. So the mystery is, what is Ebola's host animal? Perhaps some insect that sucked on Manga's blood as he labored, some forest rodent that bit him, or one he killed and ate. It could be anywhere. It could be anything. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just don't know. The hunt for Ebola's host animal is centered on the forest slopes near Gaspar Manga's charcoal pit. Insects are prime suspects. Leading the insect search party are Captain Russ Coleman from USAMRID and fellow entomologist Dr. Paul Reiter, a British scientist with the CDC. Reiter has invented an armory of unusual tools to catch mosquitoes and other biting insects. The bugs are lured into his traps by suspended canisters of dry ice. The ice releases carbon dioxide, just like we do when we breathe out. It's what leads mosquitoes to their human prey. The teams collect the traps each morning at dozens of locations in differing habitats. Traps hang at different elevations to net the high flyers. We've got to somehow devise a way to get our traps up there. You got any suggestions? Actually, we did ask them to bring some climbing gear. If they have belts and spikes, I wouldn't be reluctant to try that. Well, I'm glad that you wouldn't. <laughs> this is not the first search of its kind. Similar investigations were mounted during earlier epidemics, but they came up empty each time. Really, this is a complete enigma. We have no idea where the infection came from. We believe that perhaps somewhere around here, perhaps uh, the virus is lurking. A second team of mammal specialists also works the forest. Some of the creatures they've trapped are species unknown to them. Any one of these specimens could turn out to be an infectious carrier of Ebola. Their vital statistics are measured, and blood and tissue samples taken for study back home. Weighs seven grams. The team finds no monkeys. But since monkeys, like people, can get sick from Ebola, they are probably not the host of the virus. The entomologists also divide their quarry into species types. A prime suspect is the same mosquito that can carry and transmit yellow fever. This virulent disease shares many of the same symptoms as Ebola. Paul Reiter visits his last collection site. 
at the Manga home. His portable vacuum cleaner sucks mosquitoes from their dark hiding places. But it's unlikely that Gaspar Manga was infected at home. If the Ebola carrier were a household insect, it would have infected the entire family. As night falls, the search for answers to Ebola's riddles goes on. At Kikwi General, there's no time left for riddles. Doctors propose a desperate experiment. Taking blood from survivors and transfusing it to patients with symptoms of Ebola, they hope the survivors' antibodies will save the sick. The body's immune system responds to all viruses by producing antibodies. Antibodies seek out and attach themselves to the virus. This signals special cells called macrophages to recognize and destroy the invader. After recovering from infection, the body now has specific antibodies that will come to its defense next time the same virus attacks. Transfusions had been tried on animals without success. The Zairean doctors were proposing, in effect, to use humans as guinea pigs. The visiting virologists were outraged. French, Belgian, and American doctors argue passionately against the idea. What if these patients didn't have Ebola? The transfusions could kill rather than cure. The Zairean doctors argue that blood tests to confirm Ebola would take at least 10 days. They believe that transfusion is the victim's only hope for survival. What are we supposed to do in this situation? While we're waiting for the CDC to give us the data on this treatment, we have sick people who can't hold on for 10 days. We have to act quickly. The issue is put to a vote. The visiting doctors are outnumbered. The transfusions go ahead. This woman and her mother in the next bed survived Ebola. There were no more deaths at Kikwit General. Scientifically, the Kikwit experiment proved little. The number of patients transfused was too small to draw broad conclusions. The transfusions may not have helped at all, or they may have saved lives. The outbreak finally burned itself out, as earlier epidemics in remote areas had done. Next time, we may not be so lucky. The virus can do in 10 days what it can take AIDS 10 years to do. Its swiftness is its weakness because its victims die too quickly to pass on the disease. Other deadly viruses are not so hasty. We live in a world that has no frontiers. The frontiers are just in the mind of, of the people. Not, they are not real and they certainly don't exist for germs. Viruses, they threaten us anywhere in the world. No country is immune. In the mountains of New Mexico, death is hiding. We'll take this back to where we process animals and suit up and look at it. <laughs> a virus almost as deadly as Ebola has emerged in the American Southwest. The deer mouse is one of North America's most common mammals, but it carries a strain of the Hanta virus. It's harmless to the mouse, but lethal to man. This one's a new one. We haven't caught him before. They're pretty feisty. The virus showed up in 1993. The first cases appeared among the Navajo, then in the general population. In those initial frightening months, more than 20 died. My name is Otis Hall, and my claim to fame is that I, at, I guess, the oldest person getting the hantavirus and surviving. Otis Hall spent three weeks in a coma with hantapulmonary syndrome. 
Anta attacks the lungs and fills them with fluid. Her daughters kept a diary of the ordeal. Mother blowing blood bubbles, very cold, very scary. Blood pressure drastically changes. She's having a heart attack or a stroke are possibilities. Otis caught the disease in the same way as many other victims, by doing housework here at her ranch. We had a back bedroom that no one had been in for months and months and months. And uh, I found some mouse skeletons that I vacuumed. This is the room that I vacuumed up my skeletons right here. So I think this is the room that gave me the bug. The virus lives in the mouse's gut and is excreted in its droppings or urine. The simple act of vacuuming or sweeping turns the virus into an airborne poison, attacking the lungs with every breath. They tell me that there was at one time 20 tubes going into my body. They had given me 10 pints of blood. Uh, as I understand, they were giving me 14 different antibiotics hoping to catch something. Otis Hall made a remarkable recovery. There is no cure and no preventive vaccine for hantapulmonary syndrome. It kills nearly 60% of its victims. Hi, Regina, Dr. Scheuch. 2,000 miles away in Long Island, New York, Dr. Robert Scheuch came face to face with the ravages of Hanta. A young landscaper named Varad Hobson was brought into the Southampton Hospital emergency room. Once you get to the point where Rod was when he got here, uh, basically nothing seemed to work uh, no matter what we did it just seemed to head in a downhill spiral hobson's lungs were choked with fluid it was just an overwhelming um problem we couldn't keep up with the secretions they were just like bubbling out of his endotracheal tube as fast as you suctioned them they just became you know a problem again you just don't see 24 year old guys die in this way. I mean, he looked like he should be uh, uh, able to fight off anything the way he looked. And, and this was just something that was just so overwhelming that, uh, that the hantavirus syndrome came immediately to mind uh, as the only thing that I knew of that would do this uh, uh, in such a young, healthy person. Barad Hobson died within hours. He left a grieving fiance and an unborn son behind. The night that we buried Rod, I remember um, I, I saw a mice went across on top of the counter. It was like cake and stuff because, you know, when people brought food over, you know. I had this, I threw all of it out and I cleaned it all out, you know. But at the time, I didn't know what he had at the time, but I did see the mice. And I said, and I said to myself, I said, I hope it's not what Rod died from, like, getting sick from mice or something. And come to find out, maybe like a month later, that's what we found that he died from now. Mice carrying the hantavirus are all across the country. 93 grams. This public health hazard is the subject of urgent study. Scientists from the Museum of Southwestern Biology collect blood and other samples for analysis by the CDC in Atlanta. They may help to predict when another outbreak will occur. It would be impossible to eradicate America's entire deer mouse population. Until a cure or a vaccine is developed, the only defense is prevention. Dead rodents and their droppings can be disposed of safely without raising fecal dust. And any infestations must be promptly disinfected. Similar cleanup teams are being trained in rural communities all over America, but it may already be too late. The virus has now appeared in 23 states and reached into the heart of major cities nationwide. <laughs> These children in San Juan, Puerto Rico are playing doctor. They practice caring for a patient with another fast spreading virus, dengue fever. It often targets the young. The closest American territory Puerto Rico is battling against this painful disease. There were 20,000 dengue cases in 1994, though only a handful were fatal. Epidemics affecting millions have swept up Latin America to lap at U.S. shores. 
Cases have turned up as far north as Texas. In Cuba, just 90 miles from the Florida coast, a strain called dengue hemorrhagic fever killed 150 and sickened 300,000 a decade ago. Okay, are you uh, having muscle pains? In San Juan, Daniel Morris may be one of dengue's latest victims. He has some of the early symptoms, headache, fever, and vomiting, that precede the crippling pain that gives dengue its other name. Okay. Break bone fever. Any, any mosquito bites recently? Yeah, yeah I think we've seen a lot of mosquito bites going on. Okay. See, we're out of season for dengue, but we, we can always, you know, we have to consider that. Mario Garland recovered from the agonizing disease. I was bleeding through my intestines, uh, my esophagus, sometimes the throat. You feel very, very feverish. At the same time, it's um, you, your body gets really, really cold. You, you start to feel very, very cold. This is the villain, a mosquito that hitched a ride on slave ships from Africa over 200 years ago. Scientists now breed them for study in a lab at the San Juan branch of the CDC. The female of the species needs human blood to breed. She has a voracious and promiscuous appetite. She's doing a lot of multiple feeding. That is, she may take a, a blood meal from you, and she may come and probe me, and go and go and go like that. She's the flying equivalent of a dirty syringe, and all her victims share the needle. The mosquito can carry any one of several dengue virus types. Scientists fear another strain is making its way from Asia to the Americas. There is no vaccine. Worse, having one type of dengue doesn't give you protective antibodies against another strain. In fact, it makes you more susceptible to hemorrhagic fever. I don't know if I can face it again, knowing what I went through. Dengue is getting even smarter. It tricks the human immune system, taking control of its virus-killing machinery, then subverting it to its own purposes. The victim can lurch into convulsions, shock, and death. Carrier mosquitoes are world travelers, well adapted to urban life. They deposit their eggs where water is allowed to collect, in empty cans, flower pots, discarded tires. Health workers in Puerto Rico fight a door-to-door -door battle against the true enemy, human behavior. This is something I always say, tires don't walk by themselves. Somebody throws the garbage, somebody throws the tires. And this is something that all the citizens have to cooperate. Health inspectors set out on search and destroy missions to find the hidden places where mosquitoes lay their eggs. But new disease-carrying mosquitoes are slipping through the net. A shipment of waterlogged tires from Japan smuggled an even more aggressive species into Texas. The tiger mosquito has already spread to 17 states. We're gonna find the mosquito most frequently in, in inside houses, in bedrooms, closets, and areas like that. And the spray that was designed for controlling outdoor mosquitoes simply does not penetrate the house and get to those resting areas where the mosquito vector is, is, is located. At the CDC labs in San Juan, scientists have found a way to use mosquitoes to diagnose dengue. The pests are injected with blood from suspected dengue cases. If the virus is present, it reveals itself a week later in its new mosquito host. But the lab has bad news for Daniel. Tests confirm his aches and pains are the first stages of dengue fever. He faces a painful, debilitating disease for which there is no cure. Without a cure or a vaccine, someday other American children may play dengue games at school. At 
Victory Lodge stables near Brisbane, Australia, thoroughbreds from all over the country are prepped and groomed for races at the nearby track. No one could have foreseen that a killer virus would unleash its destructive power on this placid suburb. In September 1994, the killer entered this stable. I hope I'll never see anything like that again. It was absolutely terrifying, absolutely terrifying. As veterinarian Peter Reed examined the horses, he saw something he will never forget. Horses foaming at the mouth, their lungs filled with blood and fluid. The number of horses that were involved and the, the, uh, obviously the fact that they were all getting sick at the same time and uh, some of the symptoms that they had they were exhibiting, uh, I'd never, never seen it before, not on such a scale. The mystery illness was swift and lethal. Within days, 14 horses were dead. Stable owner Vic Rails soon developed the same symptoms as the horses. He died within the week. A stable hand, Ray Unwin, was also stricken. Researchers raced to determine the cause of the outbreak. Dr. Alex Hyatt was the first to identify the virus under an electron microscope. It's a feeling you get very rarely, I would say, once, if you're lucky, twice in your career. Because your whole fibre, your whole being knows that you've got something here different, new, exciting, and it's going to set the scientific world on fire. The virus Dr. Hyatt identified belongs to the same family as measles. But the new manifestation was terrifyingly different. It had mutated. In making copies of itself, a virus can change. It mutates. And sometimes that mutation means that suddenly the virus has the ability to infect and kill other animals. That's what may have happened in Australia. Many viruses live in just one animal. Given the right conditions, a virus crosses species barriers. It jumps from one animal to another. You've got here something new that we don't know where it comes from, we don't know where it's going, so you're working with something here which we already knew could potentially kill you. At the stables, the species jump was frighteningly fatal to both horse and man. As word of Rail's death spread, fear of a major outbreak gripped the community. The stables are less than two miles from an international airport and just one mile from a major interstate road. The autopsies were done very close to the, uh, to the front perimeters of the property and uh, there was a lot of blood and a lot of tissue that was spilt, so much so that it was running uh, down the footpath and into the, into the street. The carcasses of the animals had to be uh, disposed of and there was a lot of contamination of the roadway and uh, it was uh, quite a worrying time. Health officials feared that the virus could spread through blood and fluids. They moved quickly to quarantine all local stables and close the racetrack. They're still not sure exactly how the virus spreads. For now, this killer virus has withdrawn to its hiding place. No further outbreaks have been verified. Racing is back in full swing in Brisbane. But no one is betting that the killer won't be back. All outbreaks begin with just a few cases. The king of all killer viruses, AIDS, began its destructive path around the globe from tiny villages like this one, Masaka in Uganda. <laughs> When the epidemic began in the 1970s, deaths from AIDS were rare. Worldwide, there were just a few thousand cases. Unless there is a treatment, by 2010, there may be as many as 100 million people with AIDS. No country is immune. In Masaka, where AIDS has been raging for 30 years, there are funerals almost every day. The victim, Kamaula Ikiganda, was an ordinary man. A husband, a father, a simple shoemaker, and heterosexual. Here, as in most of the world, AIDS is spread by heterosexual contact alone. 
there's almost no homosexuality or IV drug use. The dead man's body is wrapped in tree bark and buried in his backyard. According to Ugandan custom, his brother will adopt his three children and marry their mother. If such a small child loses a father, and the father of this child is my brother, because this child is very young, he will come directly under my control. If I was a, a monogamous man, then I will become polygamous. But their mother also has AIDS. The lesions on her back are Kaposi's sarcoma, an AIDS-related cancer. Soon, there will be another funeral, and many more after that. Almost half the children in the Masaka district are orphans. Many families have no adult members left to adopt the youngsters. Orphanages, virtually unheard of in Uganda 20 years ago, are everywhere. In this part of Uganda, one in three people is HIV positive. HIV, the AIDS virus, is almost 100% deadly. It works far slower than Ebola, but is actually more lethal. Since AIDS has been here in Uganda longer than anywhere else, villages like Masaka may be a window through which we see our future. And it's a terrifying future to behold. This is the village market. Once a thriving community, more than half the store owners are dead from AIDS. Dr. Garusi is a local doctor. Yeah. All these fake formulas use it to be stalls, like the other one you can see there. But uh, due to the death rate of the people, the stalls have vanished. Ugandan epidemiologist Dr. Edward Mbedid has studied the spread of AIDS for a decade. What people need to appreciate now that the AIDS epidemic is a dynamic epidemic. It may move from one population into another population. And I think people globally should put their energies and resources not to think that this route of transmission is not, given the fact that most people worldwide practice heterosexual sex. So any society is vulnerable. AIDS makes no distinctions between age, sex, economic status, geography. AIDS doesn't care. From the remote forests of Africa, AIDS has reached out to Paris, London, New York, Miami, Los Angeles. There is no cure, and there's only one outcome. Man is a predator, the most successful species on Earth. Challenged by no other animal, yet a danger to all living things, even to himself. Deep in the Amazon jungle of Brazil, one of the most biologically diverse places on the planet, an elite core of commandos plays war games, games of destruction. Hmm? As part of their survival training, they eat whatever they can find. They hunt and kill anything that crosses their path. In May 1995, while Ebola was wreaking havoc a continent away, they intruded upon the secret hiding place of another unknown virus, a powerful predator that guns cannot defeat. The hunters became the hunted. One man after another fell ill. Some began spitting blood. What started as medevac simulation turned real. Sick men were rushed to a hospital in Manaus. The first one 
had died, had died with very serious bleeding from the lungs. When my colleague died and they transferred us to Sao Paulo, I became afraid. I thought I would die. This officer was quarantined at a hospital in Sao Paulo, one of the most populous cities in the world. I thought of everything. I even thought it might be Ebola. Virologists are baffled. For details. Man is a predator, the most successful species on Earth. Challenged by no other animal, yet a danger to all living things, even to himself. Deep in the Amazon jungle of Brazil, one of the most biologically diverse places on the planet, an elite corps of commandos plays war games, games of destruction. Hmm? As part of their survival training, they eat whatever they can find. They hunt and kill anything that crosses their path. In May 1995, while Ebola was wreaking havoc a continent away, they intruded upon the secret hiding place of another unknown virus a powerful predator that guns cannot defeat. The hunters became the hunted. One man after another fell ill. Some began spitting blood. What started as medevac simulation turned real. Sick men were rushed to a hospital in Manaus. The first one had died, had died with very serious bleeding from the lungs. When my colleague died and they transferred us to Sao Paulo, I became afraid. I thought I would die. This officer was quarantined at a hospital in Sao Paulo, one of the most populous cities in the world. I thought of everything. I even thought it might be Ebola. Virologists are baffled. Whatever is eating the lungs of these men is a new and deadly virus. The threat spreads. At a frontier town not far from the training camp, poor settlers carve farmland from the jungle. Their need for land is stronger than their fear of the killer virus. Environmentalists argue that the emergence of killer viruses is a natural consequence of man's destruction of the tropics, the rainforest's revenge against the human invader. Scientists respond that the forest has no such motives. Nature works by natural selection, survival of the fittest in the jungle. When people encounter viruses, viruses take advantage. Essa procura, tá? E esse avanço dentre a mata é grande, crescente. Então, com isso, the destruction of the rainforest is increasing, and as people continue to advance into the bush, they'll bring out new illnesses. Those who must push into the forest to survive have no choice but to face the killer virus. Todo mundo tem medo, né? Quem é que não tem medo, né? Everyone's afraid. Who wouldn't be? We have to work in the bush. All who venture deep into the forest are at risk. News of the virus outbreak worries these tourists. What if a killer virus follows them home? They're afraid and they don't know how to protect themselves. Despite the danger, their expedition proceeds. To unlock the mystery of this new virus, researchers at Brazil's Chagas Institute 
comb the Amazon's canopy looking for clues. They offer themselves as human bait to hungry mosquitoes. But the sacrifice produces few answers. Until researchers know where the virus is coming from, no one is safe. It could reach out and kill again. Like Ebola, the Brazilian virus remains a riddle. In the rainforest of Brazil, the jungle of Zaire, the American countryside, wherever we go, they lurk. Our smallest yet most powerful enemies, ready to mutate and invade. They can kill agonizingly slowly like AIDS or with the gruesome speed of Ebola. We cannot all wear spacesuits to protect ourselves. They threaten... Tomorrow night, TLC recalls the final days of this century's greatest conflict. Join us for a remembrance of the end of the war, beginning at 9. But now, we'll enlighten you on the light bulb's secret life. Next. In a world that has no frontiers, the frontiers are just in the mind of, of the people. They are not real and they certainly don't exist for germs.